Hello friends and subscribers, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Daniel Rosal, as usual, bringing you uh, this video today from Jerusalem. So I've been doing a few videos lately about the Irish reaction to Israel. A lot of it is quite hostile. And people have pointed out there is uh, also pockets of support for Israel in Ireland. And uh, one of the most active Twitter users in the Irish Twitter sphere speaking out on behalf of Israel is a gentleman that we have on here today. His name is Kieran O'Rahalig. Uh, Kieran, thank you very much for uh, for coming on and uh, being being the uh, stand up pro Israel person in Ireland for today. One of many. <laughs> so let's maybe kind of just start there because you you say one of many, and the perception from Israel, as I'm sure you know, is that um, it's very very anti. Um, but I've heard the theory for quite a while that there is more pro Israel support or people who are sort of more neutral uh, than meets the eye. What, what do you have to say about that? Um, it's definitely more than you see on social media. I would understand anybody looking at Irish Twitter thinking that the vast majority of Irish people were very anti-Israel. But, um, you know, the opinion polls don't really bear that out. Uh, there was one opinion poll recently from the Sunday Independent that, um, unfortunately, I don't have the exact figures anymore because they're now behind the paywall. I think it was something like, Okay, it was 51% said they favoured Palestine or Palestinians and it was only about 10% favoured Israel or supported Israel in this in this conflict. But um, that left something like, what, 39% who were quite nuanced in their view and took the point of view that um, they didn't really feel like supporting either side. And that same opinion poll also showed that 66% of Irish people support Hamas being prescribed as a terrorist organisation. <clears throat> and surprisingly enough, even the majority of Sinn Féinals support Hamas being prescribed as a terrorist organisation. So you don't see that coming out on Twitter. You know, you, you, at best you will see, particularly from politicians like people from people on People Before Profit, if they, if they probably won't condemn Hamas at all, um, and to do, um, it's very, very kind of perfunctory and fleeting. Um, so I think people's views are somewhat more nuanced than social media would, would lead one to believe. I think it's impor important to remember that the kind of people who come on to Twitter for both sides, from both sides of the, from both perspectives, including the people who are, let's say, more pro-Israel are probably more towards the margins in their in their viewpoints than the average person might be uh that's in yes that's a very good point actually you reminded me of another thing i wanted to say um a few universities here have well sorry the, the student unions in certain some universities have held referendums in the last few years and voted for bds they voted to boycott israel and of course it's it absolutely no effect whatsoever um because it's not within their remit to decide um the university's purchasing policy. But when these referendums are held, okay, they might be passed by 60 or 70% of the voters, but the voters are maybe only 8 to 10% of the entire student body. So 90% plus of the students, you know, the students would tend to be the most angry, I think, the ones most inclined to take a black and white view of a particular viewpoint. 90% um, of the student body just aren't bothered enough to vote. On this particular issue. So, Kieran, speaking about the whole kind of uh, Israel conflict, um, there there was a great documentary that came out a few years ago from an Irish guy called Nicky Larkin called Forty Shades of Grey that I think sums it, sums it up really well. That it's really not a, there's a conflict where there's definitely some degree of wrongdoing on both sides, and it's not black and white, and neither side is either the angel or the devil. Um, so what's your stance on kind of, broadly speaking, what, what's your take on the whole uh, the whole conflict and what we're seeing going on now with uh, with the Gaza conflict? I, I would tend to put it in, in the same context as various other border disputes or you know con conflicts between different ethnicities or nationalities that finally came to a kind of a crisis in the late 1940s. Um, you know, you had all across Eastern Europe, you had borders being re redrawn, people moving, whether by choice or being forced to move. Um, there, was, there, was a, there was a drive towards creating nation states that were far more ethnically homogenous 
Um, so I think Poland went from being 55% Polish to 95% Polish. Um, Ukrainians moved from southeastern Poland into Ukraine, or maybe the border moved, I'm not really sure. But anyway, you, you basically had a, a lot of stuff going on where people were just moving around or being forced to move. And you also had India and Pakistan, of course. You had, uh, you know, when India was partitioned, Muslims moved to the new Pakistan state, um, whether it was East Pakistan or West Pakistan. Sikhs and Hindus moved to India. They were refugees. And like the Poles and the Ukrainians and the Romanians and the Hungarians, they moved to the new place, they settled down, and by and large, nobody considers them to be refugees now. In the context of the Israel-Palestine issue, okay, yeah, six or seven hundred thousand Palestinians were displaced. Some fled, some were, were told to go by their leaders, because their leaders felt that the, the invading armies, the invading Arab armies would just wipe out the Jews and then the Palestinians could come back. But we have to also remember um, that there are, I think, something like 900,000 Jewish refugees were forced to leave Arab and Islamic countries, and they tend to be forgotten in all this. And they, most of them, I think, moved to Israel, where they now settled down, and nobody considers them to be refugees. So, like, taking this in the context of Polish people forced to move, Ukrainians, Hungarians, Romanians, Indian Hindus, Pakistani Muslims, um, Jews fleeing Arab countries. Only the, only the Palestinians are still considered to be refugees. All the other people moved to their new country. It wasn't just, it wasn't fair. They lost a lot of they lost property and land and wealth or whatever. But they moved and nobody considers them now to be refugees. So that's... One way in which I would look at it, that only the Palestinians seem to inherit this status of being refugee from generation to generation. And I find myself wondering about that. Why is that? What's interesting, Kieran, from what you're saying is that you see parallels between this conflict here in Israel and uh, border conflicts, you said, in Europe and in different parts of the world. Uh, but you don't draw a parallel between uh, Ireland's experience of British colonialism which is uh, what's most commonly cited as the re- as a reason for uh, pro-Palestinian sympathies in Ireland. So why, why is it that you don't see that as being applicable uh, in this case? I, I, I see no parallels at all. Um, for one thing, um, Irish nationalism, and even, even the IRA, even though they were, they were not genocidal. I mean, they, were, they never wanted to wipe out the British state they never wanted to wipe out all Protestants in Northern Ireland. Um, they, and that's just, that, I mean, they're the most extreme version of Irish nationalism. Irish nationalism was actually quite constitutional and um, it, it, it got its state, it settled down trying to make the best of the state and uh, it didn't, I, I think there were, there were some of the laws where um, may be unsympathetic towards Protestant minority, but there are no specifically anti-Protestant laws. There are no laws specifically relegating Protestants to secondary status. I mean, definitely there were, there were laws that um, supported the Catholic position a bit too much, but um, there, there was nothing in comparison to um, the kind of laws, you know, the, the dimmy status laws that we ha- have seen in, um, in, in Islamic countries. Um, Oppressing Jews and Muslims, yes, yeah, Jews, Jews and Christians. Um, so I, I don't really see any parallels. Um, I, I, I think that Palestinian nationalism is a quite different, quite different thing. So, Kiran, I'm just interested how you went about kind of forming your viewpoints about Israel and becoming informed about this conflict. You, you mentioned that you were over here on a visit in 2019, but uh, how did you sort of get interested in uh, in this uh, in this conflict and get informed about what's happening here? Um, I suppose it goes back to when I was at school. Um, at school, we did a lot about the Holocaust. Um, it was covered a lot in the curriculum. And I was struck by how um, there was nobody to speak for the Jews. They didn't have their own state. There was nobody to sit at international conferences or at the League of Nations to thump tables and saying, this, this can't be happening, this is, this is wrong. So they were, they, were literally, they were just left on their own. And 
you know, I can I can see parallels today with the unfortunate Kurds or the Rohingya in in Myanmar or even those African ethnic groups in Darfur who are currently being slaughtered by Arab militias and nobody is paying any attention at all. Like you really need every ethnic group really needs to have their own state. Um, and it's also the kind of a recognition thing. If if you have your own state, then suddenly you become a more substantial thing, like you're in the Olympics, you're playing other nations in soccer or basketball or whatever, you're you're in the Eurovision, you know, you if you become a recognizable thing, so people can relate to you. If somebody attacks Switzerland or Sweden or Ireland or, or whatever, people will be able to point to that straight away and say, Oh yeah, that's there, you know, they're on the map. Whereas the Kurds aren't on the map. They're just a kind of a blob. In southeastern Turkey and northern Syria and northeastern Iraq, people uh, people watching this w- would say, "Well, the Palestinians also deserve uh, self determination and to have their own state." What would you what, what 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 do you think about that? Well, they were offered their own state on numerous occasions. Um, in the late nineteen forties, they could have had it. Um, there are various occasions. I think in two thousand and two thousand and eight. Um, I think was it Ehud Olmert or Ehud Barak? I think it was Ehud. Almert offered them um, pretty much all of the West Bank and even even was offering a little bit extra so that the Palestinian negotiators could go back and say, we've got the equivalent area of the West Bank. And I mean, in fairness, they do have, you know, it's small, but they do have the Gaza Strip already. And what are they doing with it? They're just using it to attack Israel. Hamas, Hamas is not interested in the well-being of the Gazan people. Hamas is only interested in destroying Israel. So they, they, I would argue that they already have a portion of a state and they're not making much of it. They're not, they're not, they're, they're, okay, I don't, the, the ordinary Gazans don't really have much choice in terms of who's ruling them, but their leaders are not interested in the betterment of the Gazan people. It's, it's, it's not a state that's for the improvement of, of the lives of Gazan. Gazan it's a state that's being used as a weapon against Israel and only only for that. A lot of people, Kieran, in the uh, pro-Israel community in Ireland would feel that the Irish media is very hostile towards Israel and has been for quite some time. Uh, but I see there's some new platforms coming on the scene like uh, Gripped.ie, which I gather is somewhat controversial. But I'd just be interested as, you know, someone who's, let's say, more pro-Israel than perhaps your your average person in Ireland, uh, what do you think of the mainstream media, RTE, etc., as they're presenting the conflict? And uh, do you get your news from other sources, or wh- how do you feel about all this? Um, I think the mainstream media in Ireland is generally hostile towards Israel. Um, it's it's something we have to constantly chase them about um, in terms of inaccuracies that they, that they put up and. Um, sometimes you wonder. I mean, sometimes they will they will correct things. Um, sometimes you wonder if if the the error was intentional or just um or, or unintentional. Um, I mean, in, in the Irish in, in, in newspapers like the Irish Times or the Irish Independent, opinion pieces that are anti-Israel vastly outnumber the ones that are pro-Israel. And I mean, it, it, it's a struggle to get a letter published that is pro-Israel. I, I've had a little bit of success recently, and so, so have some others. But on any given day, um, the letters will be 3 to 1 anti-Israel or 4 to 1 anti-Israel. And they might say, well, we're only reflecting, you know, the editors might say we're only reflecting the volume of um, mail, that maybe the mail coming in is 3 to 1 anti-Israel or 4 to 1. But it's not really their role. Should they not be given slightly more equal, um, more of a balance, despite the fact that um, things may be slanted one particular way. Yeah, pre- presenting both viewpoints kind of more equally. So, Kieran, just interest. I mean, you're quite vocal on Twitter in terms of your support for Israel. Um, and as we both know, the uh, Irish Twitter sphere can be pretty hostile to these type of viewpoints. So just, just wondering... Um, Firstly, how you kind of handle that. And secondly, in in the more important sphere called real life with your friends and family, uh, do you ever get into discussions about Israel and what do they make of your uh, your online activism? As regards dealing with abuse on Twitter, I, I just, I just it, it makes me laugh a lot of the time because it's so, 
formulaic. I mean, you get this kind of a word soup of genocide, apartheid, colonialism, all this stuff. It's like um, it's like they've, they've swallowed in a BDS leaflet and they're just regurgitating whole paragraphs from it. Um, I... I I mean my my fa- family and friends know how I feel. Um, they they don't know so much about my online activism. I don't really go into that detail with them about it. Um, but yeah, we do have arguments every now and again. I've uh, it's, I mean, the the arguments are, am, are amicable. Um, they I I think by and large they would be like a lot of Irish people. They would tend to see. Lots of Palestinians dying, so therefore Palestinians are the underdogs, therefore Palestinians are the good guys. And when we get down to that kind of level of, of argument, I, you know, the obvious retort is, well, would you be happier if more Israelis just had the good grace to just drop dead and even up the score? Um, so, I, in fairness, I'm the one who's read all the books and I have all the facts at hand, whereas Dave, you're just kind of reacting to the latest story. So it's, I, I have to, what am I trying to say? I have to kind of not, um, just not to give them a blizzard of facts because I think that might be just too much and maybe they might actually resent being, you know, bombarded with all this stuff. I try to aim it more at the heart and say, well, you know, what, what do you think Israel should do? Um, and also, actually, one one thing, and it's something I keep banging on about, um, the, the the story of the Jewish refugees from Arab and Islamic countries, that tends not to get told. And when people hear that, they realise, oh, okay, you know, there is more to this, there is more to this story than, than one side. You know, there wasn't only, there wasn't just one bunch of refugees. That's something you have to keep reminding people of. Um, but by and large, people, I, 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 I mean, you say the arguments, we have, we have arguments, but the arguments don't get hostile. And going back to the, going back to 2019, when I mentioned, when I told people I was going to Israel, 99% of the responses were positive and curious. There's one guy at work, one colleague said, tell them to get the F out of Palestine. So fair enough, you know, I, just, I didn't take the bait. But the vast majority of people, friends and family were interested, and they were interested when they came back and they wanted to know, did you see this, did you see that, what about this, what about that? And it wasn't, you know, there, there wasn't any hostility there. There was just genuine curiosity. Yeah, I um, I had quite a number of people come over from Ireland when I got married here a few years ago. Um, and, you know, people who I think had never conceived of coming to Israel before. A lot of people had had a really good time, but one, one of my friends has really kind of fallen into that uh, anti-Israel camp. And uh, we did... I just want to say about falling out of friends. I think it's an interesting question for for folks. Maybe it's perhaps a little bit more personal when you're living in the middle of this conflict. But we did have something of a falling out because you know he was tweeting about Israel being genocidal and uh, you know just ethnic cleansing and kind of all the stuff almost from Richard Boyd Barrett's little uh, book or pamphlet, as you called it. You know, and I said, well. If, if you think I'm living in a geno- genocidal country, why would you come and patronize the economy for, uh, you know, when I got married? So uh, I, I, I find there is kind of a red line, but most people are, you know, I think I'm very wary of echo chambers. Uh, and I think just having court, sort of healthy debate with the other side is useful as well. Something else that I've kind of observed on Twitter is that people seem to assume that either side is just, you know, 100% partisan, like at a few people tweeting at me today with photos of dead dead uh, Gazans, you know, horrible photos that I'm sure you see as well. And they said, well, what do you make of that? And I think the implication is, you know, you, you guys are genocidal subhumans and this is what you're looking for. So I tried to write back kind of a rational response that this is a war and nobody on the Israeli side is looking for dead pictures of dead children or dead children. Um, but that this is what happens in an armed conflict, especially in the Gaza Strip that is chock full of people, um, etc. So there's definitely, it's very polarized in the the Twitter sphere. In that kind of instance, I remind people of the Allied bombing of Germany in in 1945. Like, um, they say, oh, Israel is capital bombing Gaza, Israel is trying to commit genocide. And I know, of course, the, the deaths are horrible. But um, as I said, it's a war, a war that Israel didn't start. And 
you know, the the Allies killed more people bombing Dresden in two nights in February 1945 than Israel has in several weeks of the war in Gaza. So, you know, it, it, it obviously isn't genocide. It is, um, it is a war, as you say. Unfortunately, people die, particularly when one of the combatants hides itself amongst the civilian population. And crucially, nobody... Nobody applied the same standards, or even today would apply the same standards to the Allies. Nobody would look back today and say, oh, the Allies committed war crimes, or the Allies should have negotiated the ceasefire. Nobody would ever say that today. So why are they applying this, this much higher standard to Israel? Um, so, Kiran, there's been this uh, sort of international controversy um, that I had a role maybe in kicking off regarding Richard Boyd Barrett talking about, uh, you know, that there should be an intifada. And, you know, he's obviously just kind of a pinup hater of Israel. But something I'm always interested in is kind of thinking who's the opposite to that, right? I mean, he's a very marginal figure in Irish politics, but you have Sinn Féin who are less marginal and, you know, potentially are going to get a lot more votes in the next election. So, you know, when when we're looking in the Dáil and in the Shannad for people who are really kind of standing up to the anti-Israel sentiment and uh, taking on the likes of Mary Lou MacDonald, Richard Boyd Barrett, Paul Murphy, and all those kind of, let's say, agitators on the left, do you think there is any kind of a pushback at the moment in the Oireachtas? Not an awful lot. There's one senator called Senator Ned O'Sullivan who is pro-Israel. And he's a very brave voice. Uh, apart from that, I think there is, there is an Oireachtas Friends of Israel group, but I'm not really sure that they do an awful lot. They seem to be they seem to spend a lot of time in, in the closet. Um, I mean, you, you, you would find the main government leaders um, pushing back on some of the more extreme rhetoric. You know, Leo Varadkar and Michal Martin would, would, would tend to distance themselves from the more, more extreme rhetoric. And a few months ago, when there was a report from Amnesty International about accusing Israel of being an apartheid state, Michal Martin actually said that she wouldn't use that term and he did, didn't find the term helpful. So, you know, it, but, but still at the same time, he has issued some very harsh criticisms of Israel's actions in Gaza. So... I mean, apart from Senator Ned O'Sullivan, there isn't really anybody you can point to and say that you know they are supportive or understanding of Israel's position. It's, it's kind of it's degrees of opposition. Um, you know, Leo Varadkar and Michael Martin did did very strongly condemn Hamas in the first few days after the October seventh attacks, but then they very quickly um, moved into the usual attacking Israel kind of. Um, speeches and you know, comments and every now and again they would say oh of course we condemn Hamas but 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 so yeah there's not, there's not much there really there, apart from Senator Ned O'Sullivan there isn't really much in terms of pushback unfortunately. From your experience Kiran of uh, knowing other folks I presume you know people in the uh, pro-Israel movement in Ireland or people who might share you know broadly speaking your viewpoint about this um, what what kind of people, do, you know, what does Irish support for Israel look like? Where does it come from? You know, is there any kind of common characteristics or demographic you can point to uh, for this group? There really isn't. Um, in the group, I mean, uh, there's a wide variety of backgrounds and classes and ages. Um, and, you know, different geographical locations around the country. Okay, I mean, a lot of them are in Dublin, but then a lot of Irish people are in Dublin anyway. I think like a quarter of the population lives in Dublin. <clears throat> no, I can't think of any, I can't think of any particular characteristics that would unite us all. So, Kiran, there is, um, I've heard from a lot of people that there was this turning point um, in maybe sort of perhaps even the 1970s when, you know, around the time when Israel was founded, that Ireland was actually kind of quite supportive as a whole of Israel. Um, were you around back then or, uh, you know, have you heard that story as well? And can you tell me exactly when that turning point occurred in public sentiment? I was around then. I have vague, me- I'm, old, I'm old enough to have vague memories of the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And I mean, I, I don't remember the exact conversations amongst parents and family, but I think I get a general sense that there was a kind of a nervousness about, you know, will Israel survive or will Israel be overrun? Because obviously for the first few days, Israel was caught completely 
unawares and the Egyptians were making major advances across the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, so I do remember those conversations. Um, I think the Lebanon, the, the situation in Lebanon might have started being a turning point. There's one politician called um, Lenahan. Oh my God, I can't think of his first name now. He, he was the Minister for Defence. Brian Lenahan. Brian Lenahan. You know, I'm talking about Brian Lenahan Sr. and not, not, not Brian Lenahan Jr. Brian Lenahan Sr. was Minister for Defence back in the late 70s, early 80s. And the Irish Army were, the Irish Army was in southern Lebanon acting as uh, a peacekeeping force, UNIFIL. And um, he, he mentioned that as being a point when he started to kind of move away from being pro-Israel and more pro-Palestinian. Um, it, it was around that time that a lot of Irish soldiers were being shot by the South Lebanon Army and some other proxies that were at least ostensibly backed by Israel. So, and he think he, he went there a few times and felt that he wasn't impressed by the behaviour of the Israeli army. So that might be the turning point. Um, but then it was also the IRA. I mean, the IRA had had close ties with the PLO and they would have started to um, agitate for Palestinianism and Palestinian nationalism. Um, I mean, the, the, the Northern Ireland issue definitely has um, had its effects. I'm not really, it's a kind of a chicken and egg, chicken and egg situation in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm not sure whether the loyalist and unionist community was pro-Israel, so the IRA, so the, the IRA and the nationalists decided to be pro-Palestine, or whether the IRA decided to be pro-Palestine and then the you know, Protestant unionist loyalist community decided to be pro-Israel, but that has had its effects as well. That would have change some minds um, to be more anti-Israel. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned the peacekeepers as being a contributor. I've heard from a lot a lot of people that's sort of the experience of UNIFIL people turn opinions, but I had a few conversations over the years here uh, with peacekeepers who were deployed to not just UNIFIL, uh, UNSO as well, which is another one of the UN missions, and seem to have quite, quite a nuanced and rounded understanding of the conflict, I definitely didn't get the, I didn't form the impression that they were sort of overwhelmingly anti-Israel. Um, so that interests me. But I guess, as you say, there's more than one factor at play uh, changing public opinion. It'd be great to get those stories out. I don't mean necessarily identifying the people, but just just to hear from them because, um, you know, it'd be interesting to hear what their viewpoint was because they were upfront and close to the whole thing. Um, Kieran, so another sort of thing that comes up a lot here is this idea that Ireland is, you know, the most anti-Semitic country in Europe. And uh, as you know, I'm a, a Jewish person who was born in Ireland, and I certainly did encounter a couple of pockets of anti-Semitism. But, you know, I've made the point before that there is anti-X feeling in pretty much um, every country. And uh, I, I personally disagree with this idea that Ireland is a country kind of drenched in anti-Semitism, which is the uh, sort of opinion that a lot of people seem to be putting out there on Twitter. Um, as someone who's living in Ireland, I'm not. Uh, what's your take on all this question? Well, as somebody who's not Jewish, I mean, I'm I'm nervous about making any wild claims. Um, I've seen I've seen some polls saying that I don't know, I think 77 percent of people would be happy to have a Jewish person in the family and. Ninety um, percent would be happy to have a Jewish person um, as a colleague, but that still leaves twenty percent who wouldn't like to have a Jewish person in their family, and ten percent who wouldn't be happy to have a Jewish person as a colleague. So, a Jewish person coming to work in an Irish company, potentially one person in every ten doesn't want to have them around. So, it's not it's not it's not a comfortable position to be in. Um, but it, I, I, what I, all I want to take issue with is the idea that um, Ireland is the most anti-Semitic country in Europe. I don't think we are. Um, I think levels of anti-Semitism here compared to even other West, Western European countries are actually fairly low. And then if you go to East European countries, you know, anti-Semitism there really is quite high. So I'm not trying to gaslight anyone. Um, I know I'm not Jewish, so I'm, I'm never going to experience the feeling of being the one Jewish person in an office or whatever, but it's just the, the specific claim that Ireland is the most anti-Semitic country in Europe, I, I would tend to contest that. 
I'm going to leave as well uh, for people interested in learning more about this, a link in the description, because I think you you told me, Kieran, about some interesting surveying that was done by the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL, and they kind of ask a few questions to try to gauge the level of anti-Semitism in a particular country. And I looked at Ireland's uh, sort of overall rating on their barometer, or whatever they call it, and it was relatively towards the lower end of Europe and actually Greece, uh, which I think a lot of people would be surprised. And I don't want to kind of just take pop shots at any one country, but came out a lot significantly higher um, than Ireland. So I think there's even data there to kind of contest that idea that Ireland is uh, some kind of a uh, hotbed of anti-Semitic sentiment. I've uh, highlighted Richard Boyd Barrett. Uh, people have told me he's marginal and I've said I agree, but I think he does make anti-Semitic discourse. So, you know, it certainly exists, uh, but that is very different than saying that it's, you know, that's a viewpoint shared by a majority of Irish society. And um, anyway, that's that's my personal take on the matter. Yeah, I think Richard Boyd Barrett, if he has any self-critical faculties at all, he'll look at that camera, he'll look at that video from last weekend and realise that he just made a bit of a fool of himself. I think I think you might have finally gone a little half a step too far, or maybe even a maybe even a full step. Um, it would be good to see more criticism, but to give Michal Martin credit, uh, he did, and I don't think when he was presented with the you know what what Richard Boy Barrett said, I I got the feeling that he hadn't seen the tape, which is almost uh, people have said it's a bit Hitler esque the way Boy Barrett was ranting, uh, but you know he did at least give some pushback, saying that that kind of rhetoric. Uh, isn't helpful uh, calling for an intifada it's obviously a separate separate debate that I understand is very much um, top of mind in Ireland at the moment as to what this new hate speech legislation would and would not cover um, but he certainly uh, skirted skirted that question all right Kieran. so it was um, amazing to chat to you uh, you're very much a twitter man from what I know about you or x as it's now being called so if people want to follow you uh, on that platform what's your what's your handle it's um, a slightly unusual one. It's Wascarito. That's W A S C U R I T O. I won't bore you with, with the long um, description or long story about how I came up with that, but that, that's it anyway. W A S C U R I T O. I'll put a link in the description. Kiran has interesting takes um, on Israel from Ireland. Uh, and I also see your bio also says that you are a Gwail Gore fan of the Irish language, or at least a partial one, as you'd say as well as a vegan, and I'm sure you're uh, many, many things beyond those two. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Thank, thanks so much, Kieran. I um, appreciate you taking the time to share your story and experience and uh, have a good evening over in Ireland.